Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, the home of the most powerful government in the world. The city was not immune to the George Floyd riots. We spoke to people in D.C. to get their thoughts on the chaos. As pandemonium erupted in the aftermath, I was really afraid of the worst being brought out of people. We were already in a pandemic where people were frustrated, people had been laid off, locked down, and I knew that that would exacerbate the situation, and it did. We saw some of the worst rioting we've seen in recent history. That broke my heart as well because that did not honor or respect what happened. It did not bring greater peace or solutions. It turned the whole debate around to become less productive to where now people were more just focusing on bringing peace back. Everything became less about actual legislative change and it became an argument over larger political issues. Here today, there still is no real legislative package or anything that's been passed to address what happened. And the rioting really took away from the solutions aspect of the process. There have been official Black Lives Matter chapters, you know, ones that are recognized by the Global Network Foundation. Then there are unofficial chapters. There are groups that use Black Lives Matter in their name that aren't affiliated at all with the Global Network Foundation. Um, the best way I could describe the, the relationship, you know, some Black Lives Matter chapters have been getting uh, substantial grants from the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation after it had um, raised all that money in 2020. So in the following years, you know, there's been a lot of money flowing from the foundation to the local chapters. But in many cases, these are fiscally sponsored too. So you don't know too much about them. There are some larger, more prominent chapters, but there's been content. There's been lawsuits. Um, there was an organization called Black Lives Matter Grassroots that was going to function as sort of like an umbrella for all these chapters. There's been a contentious relationship there. So it's it's very in flux. And it's what makes that even more difficult is there's not been a lot of transparency from the organization itself, like the big uh, Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation. There's not been a lot of clarity on leadership. There's not been a lot of, um, you know, there's been no cohesive organizational structure that's evident either, to me either from the 990s for its website. So the, the theme here is there's a lot of confusion and a lot of uncertainty about what the money has really been going to fund and, and who's in charge of it. So our offices are actually just a few blocks north of the White House. And of course, some of the ugliest protests took place very close to the White House. Uh, one of the most egregious being that they were burning an old Episcopal church right across Lafayette Square from the White House. And Lafayette Square itself saw all sorts of damage and some of the streets just off of that and also K Street, one of the main thoroughfares. Lots of ugly damage, lots of buildings boarded up. And that's not the only place, of course, in D.C. where you had problems of violence and destruction. It also happened in uh, some of the poorer neighborhoods as well. One of the phenomena you always see with the left is the really radical extremists. They don't really care about whatever the supposed issue of the day is, in this case, police brutality. They just care about destruction. There was a video that was widely shared and there was you know, about a 30 year old black woman who clearly lived in this neighborhood where she was marching and she cared about police brutality, which is what BLM is supposedly about, right? And what does she see? She sees these two college aged white girls in Antifa masks vandalizing the businesses in her neighborhood. And she's horrified. You know, she's there to protest peacefully they're there to be violent, radical extremists, destroying her own neighborhood. And she says, stop, stop, because she realizes, like, I, I don't want my neighborhood destroyed, and I don't want my cause, the issue at stake here, to be tied up with this kind of vandalism, nihilism, craziness. So this is something that happens over and over again with the left. They seize on a crisis in the news to push a much broader and extremist agenda. In the midst of so much chaos and confusion, people started to ask the question, 
what is the Black Lives Matter National Organization? And are they really part of the movement that they claim to represent? I wanted t-shirts and I wanted to get out the word about Black Lives Matter and this awesome movement. And I remember my boss saying, you don't want to support that. And I said, you know, how is that possible? Um, at the time, we didn't know the full story with what had happened, but it seemed as if things were really bad and as if the country was having an important conversation. And he told me, he said, look at their website, look them up, find their website, see what they stand for. And what I found on their website was starkly different from the national conversation. So now we know more. We know that Black Lives Matter has not stood for black lives as far as the national organization. They've stood more for political empowerment of the Democratic Party. They've stood more for passing hands. They've been used for fraud and things like that. Um, and even some of the Black Lives Matter chapters, the Black Lives Matter 10 has called out the national organization for being political, for not caring about people, for not doing anything positive for the black community. What I saw on the website was they were against the nuclear family. They were against any type of community structure. They had this progressive vision of no families, no thought of a mother and father. Left-wing leaders are almost always exploiting much more reasonable and moderate people concerned about a particular issue, like problems with policing. So one of the best evidences of how disparate the leadership in national BLM groups are from the ordinary folks who might be at a genuinely peaceful protest saying we're concerned about police is to look at this big splits that quickly grew up between local chapters of Black Lives Matter in particular cities versus the national leadership, which in addition to being more radical, was also extremely greedy and scooped up most of those dollars. Uh, you know, very quickly, you began to see fighting between local chapters saying, nobody's giving us millions of dollars, including the national group that supposedly exists to help people like us. Um, it's a bizarre combination of violent extremism and grifting. It's quite a, quite a nasty cocktail that you have in the national leadership of BLM. It was a very clear Marxist group, and I was shocked by that. And they took the website down, changed it, gave it new fluffy language, rebranded, you know, used the Pan-African colors, and all of a sudden they were a black power organization, but behind the scenes they were still a Marxist organization with Marxist goals that do not align with what the black community needs. And we saw that play out uh, in the aftermath. The theme of the Black Lives Matter story is one of a missed opportunity. At a time when America was largely united in outrage, instead of using that for good, the leaders of the national organization capitalized on it, betraying the needs of the very people that they claim to represent and using the goodwill of the American people to enrich themselves. $90 million of, and it was ordinary people's money, right? And a lot of times you'll see foundations fund these nonprofits and they have more money than they know what to do with, you know, $15 billion foundations. In this case, the most interesting thing was Black Lives Matter reported that the average donation on its main fundraising platform was like for $30. So it's regular, regular Americans giving in the summer of 2020. And you wonder, you know, it's, it's flowed to this organization that has so many questions surrounding its operations, its management, its priorities, its radicalism. What could that, what's the opportunity cost of that money? What could that money have done? What could the Jackie Robinson Foundation have done with some of that money? You know, what could the 100 Black Men of America or any one of its chapters have done with some of that money? What could the Boys and Girls Clubs of America have done with some of that money or the United Way or, or the YMCA? Or, or any number of local, thousands of local groups in every community in this country that are active on some of the exact same issues that would be of most importance to people if you just ask, ask them on the street, what's the most important thing we could do to improve some of these issues? There's so many groups out there that already have a track record of working on these issues. 
How many college scholarships could $90 million have paid for? How many after school programs or youth mentoring programs? How many ex offender prisoner reentry and support programs could that have paid for? So that's that's the question that I always come back to with this is I wonder if this was a an opportunity cost that was really missed. And um, and I think that's when we look at Black Lives Matter and what's happened with the organization and the finances, I think that's the unavoidable thing to keep coming back to. Dr. Claude Anderson is one of my favorite historians, and he talks about how the black community has sought political power, though they have no community or economic power. And so you're doing things out of order, and that needs to be refocused on. We need to go back to why was George Floyd in this position in the first place? Why was this in this community, he's at a store where you're arresting people for using fraudulent money. That was a problem so much so that they were now calling the police on people who were doing this. Look at these issues in this community. If a black child cannot read by third grade, they will end up in jail and they will create a spot in a local jail for that child. So are these, are we focusing on education? Are we focusing on upward mobility? I want to see more support for education, for solutions at the root. Okay, we can change, we can make it where a policeman can never pull a gun on anyone. That won't solve the problems of the community. So we need to look at that more closely first.